opportunity whenever you want. I'm ready now. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Karabaitis. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the quiet guy who sits in the corner over there. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the symplectic approach to canonical transformations. And this is the ground that we're going to cover. So I'm going to talk about canonical transformations. I'm going to talk about something called direct conditions, which are required for a transformation to be canonical. And then we'll jump into the heart of this, of this topic, the symplectic form. Um, we'll do a little matrix manipulation. And then we'll jump to some conclusions, remarks, and questions. OK, so everybody here knows what Hamilton's equations of motion are. And we know that a transformation from one um, phase space coordinate system to another has to preserve Hamilton's equations of motion. So this is, this is nothing new here. We all know this. Um, and in class, we learned a couple of ways to see if a transformation is canonical. Now, the word canonical always scared me a little bit. Canonical just means the simple general set of standard equations. So that word just typically gets applied to Hamilton's equations, and they're canonical. But, but we found we've got a few ways to see if a transformation is canonical if we are preserving Hamilton's equations of motions. The first set that we looked at was Poisson brackets, and then a recent homework assignment about generating functions. I'm going to talk about direct conditions, which have to be met for a transformation to be canonical. We'll jump into the symplectic method, which is what this, this presentation is about. FYI, if you ever get a chance to read up on this or to look this up or hear about it, there's another way. It's called the Liouville, Liouville differential form. And basically, it's a fancy way of saying that phase space flows and the volumes and information are preserved. So Hamilton's equations of motion have to be preserved. The big question. What is or are the conditions for a given transformation for a mapping from one phase space coordinate system to another phase space coordinate system for the purpose of making a problem easier to solve? What are the, what are the conditions for that transformation to be canonical? Let's do a simple problem, no time dependence, which is, I know, fabulous. All physics students love no time dependence. So we've got a Hamiltonian in one phase space, and the Hamiltonian is it's the same Hamiltonian, but it's another phase space. And we have our time derivatives of our phase space coordinates. There's position and momentum. So what's the what's the time derivative of momentum? It's the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to I mean the time derivative of the position is the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to momentum. It's also equal to the Poisson bracket of position and Hamiltonian, likewise for momentum. So again, nothing new here. All same it's ground we've already we've already covered. Now there's when you ask, OK, what is this time derivative? What is the time derivative of this, this new phase space variable? We can represent it in one of two ways. We can say, OK, it's in terms of the old phase space coordinate system. Or we can go ahead and say that if we look at the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to a new, the new phase space coordinate system, we get this summation here. So we basically have two different equations. We've got a Poisson, basically this equation up here which we can rewrite in terms of the Poisson bracket and you know substitutions. And then we have this, which is the same phase space coordinate derivative in terms of the new um, phase space coordinate system. So once we set something up like that, we can, we can match similar terms. And the result is that, well, this equation and this equation have to be the same, because they're both talking about the same thing. And everything's, everything's very physics-y and legit. So we come up with these, these relationships here. These are relationship, relationships that act to map the old phase space coordinate system to the new phase space coordinate system. And if you take a look, close look, you can sort of, they're sort of crisscrossed, and there's symmetry, et cetera, et cetera. So this is good. This is good. These are direct conditions that tell us you know, what conditions have to be met in the mapping to get us from the old phase space to the new phase space. And what we did for position, we can also do for momentum. And it's the same thing. And what do we have? We have what I, what I promised earlier. These conditions, they're, they're referred to as direct conditions, they must be met for a transformation to be canonical 
for a transformation from one phase space coordinate system to another to keep Hamilton's equations of motions preserved. Now, I'm sure this means absolutely nothing. It's very, it's very, you know, makes your eyes water. These conditions, they have to be preserved. And as Goldstein puts it, there's probably there, there is a more elegant way of representing that, representing them. We can put them in matrix form. So that's one of the drivers for the symplectic method. Now, there's a second driver for the symplectic method that you will laugh at. But, um, but basically, there's, there's two drivers. And one is, let's get these, these direct conditions into an elegant form. And so the path that we're going to take is, is we're going to create a lot of matrices. And again, your eyes are going to water because yada, 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 matrices, this and that. So let's say that we take our old phase space and put it in a, a, a column vector, call it eta. And then let's say, OK, well, that's great. For the Hamiltonian, we can take the partial with respect to each of these variables. Let's, let's create another column vector, OK, looking good. And then we, then we remember that, hey, I know what this guy is. This guy's minus um, the time derivative of momentum, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually replace all these terms with Hamilton's equations of motion. And now, as you can see from the red arrows, I've got, um, I've got red arrows pointing at the minus signs. And you may wonder, well, what's the deal there? And that's the second reason we're putting this in, in what is called what will be called symplectic form. Let's define a matrix. It's called a skew symmetric or anti-symmetric matrix. And I'll do a simple example in a little bit. It's basically 0, 1, negative 1, 0. And if you've got more than one, more than one momentum, I mean more than one uh, position momentum variable, then you're going to block these out. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to apply this very strange matrix to our column vector. And what does it do? It, do, it does something that appears very trivial. It takes this and creates this, where we basically switch the order and we got rid of the minus sign. And that is going to be a big thing. It, 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 it's very confusing. It's like, what are they doing? That is going to be a very big thing. I now have Hamilton's equations of motion in the matrix form, technically. Okay? There's no minus sign in front of the, the time derivative of the momentum. And now, Position and momentum are, are they're, they're referred to as being symmetric now because the minus sign is gone. And this is symplectic form. And I know that still, this probably doesn't make a, a hill of beans to you guys. But we did this for the original phase space coordinate system. We're going to do the same thing for the new phase space coordinate system. The same, just going to crunch through the numbers the same. Take a look at that middle line that has got the boxes. Um, basically, what we're saying is that the, the new coordinate system okay, can be written as what's effectively going, to, effectively going to be a row vector and a column vector. Again, we're playing with matrices. And when all the dust settles, what we're going to say is that, that C dot, and actually, and I apologize, in Goldstein it's a zeta, but you know, all these letters are all Greek to me, so I don't know. But this, Z, this C dot will equal some matrix times column vector, E to dot. So what does this all mean? Well, again, the whole idea is we want to get we want to get from these guys here from the original phase space to the new phase space, and how are we going to do it? Well, we need a, a road map. We need some kind of a mapping. So this matrix is M, and this column vector is the old phase space coordinate system, and we're going to end up with a new phase space coordinate system. And again, I'm sure that this doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'm going to basically take a few more steps, and it will, I promise. There's a whole lot of math that we're going to do because, you know, we have this equation right here. Hang on a second. We've got this guy right here. C dot or zeta dot or whatever is m times eta dot. And we're going to try and simplify it by all of this math, which I'm not going to go into. But I believe me when I tell you that these are all substitutions that we're doing. So we're going to do a lot of substitutions in, you know, with matrices. And then when all the dust settles inside the red box, you've got this matrix multiplication thing that's called a symplectic condition. J, which is our original anti-symmetric or skew-symmetric matrix, if it equals the Jacobian matrix, symplectic matrix times itself times the transpose, then you have proven that you have a canonical transformation. And still, and I apologize, I'm sure that this doesn't make a whole hill of beans to you guys. But this is the, the simple trick that you can use to ask yourself, okay, 
my, my colleague says he's got a canonical transformation, pop it into this, this box, and you can tell him like that whether it works. Okay, remember when I said earlier that we have to preserve these direct conditions when we did all of our hand waving? Remember that? That, that, that those direct conditions have to ma be maintained to, for a, a transformation to be canonical. This page, where we're, again, we're sort of playing around with these matrices. The fact that I have a, a tran an inverse of a transpose and the regular symplectic, symplectic Jacobian, that's where they are. That's where they, they're living right there. So this symplectic method, which seems very strange in its own matrices, is preserving the direct conditions and it's giving us a very powerful and simple tool to determine if a transformation is canonical. What have I done? What have I done? It's very simple. It's just I, I've got my old phase space system. I have a roadmap, which is my symplectic Jacobian matrix, and I have my new phase space system. So if I can, if I can, uh, how's my time doing, by the way? Yep, I know. You'll be on warning at 15. I'm always getting warnings. Let's play a little bit on the whiteboard here. I want to see that I use the whiteboard too. Let's just pick a let's just pick a matrix. Call it uh, first. I'm going to pick J. J is zero, one, negative one, zero. Okay. And let's say that M is equal to something simple A, B, C, D. Okay. So that M transpose is going to be rows between columns. Sorry, I I kicked out after fifth grade math, so you got to bear with me there. Okay. Right. Yeah. That Okay, so is this guy, is, does this represent a mapping that's, that, preserves the canonic, that preserves the canonical form? Well, let's see. This has to be true. Okay, well, what, what is this? This is 0, 1, negative 1, 0. Does that equal question mark A, B, C, D? 0, 1, negative 1, 0. A, B, C, D. Okay, so let's see. That's B, that's negative A, that's negative C, and then I multiply these guys, that's A times B, right? Plus, minus B times A, and A times D minus C times B. Boy, am I going to be embarrassed if I screw this up. C times D, C times B, minus D times A, and then C times, oh God, I screwed this up. Can you do me this, man? Zero B, zero D, negative A, negative C. A times B minus A times B. Central C. No, you gotta let me do this. You gotta let, let me do my baby steps here. A times D minus B times C. Love it. C times B minus D times A. C times D minus C times B. Great, great. I know this is zero, I know this is zero. I'm gonna play a little bit with this. I'm gonna say this is negative A times D minus C times B. And then I'm gonna say A times D minus C times B times zero, one, negative one, zero is equal to zero, one, negative one, zero. And my trick is that this guy has to equal one. And this is the determinant of that matrix so my symplectic Jacobian matrix has to be square, and the determinant has to be plus one, so that I can preserve volumes and information. This may not seem like I found much of anything, but if my symplectic matrix, my mapping, looked like this, if that were the case, then this guy here would be my plus one bracket. So I tried it, it works, the math worked. So built into this nonsense is the plus one bracket. So there's a connect here. It looks weird, what are you doing? You're just throwing stuff around and it doesn't make, make, make a lot of sense, but built into this is the plus one bracket. Okay, conclusions. Goldstein says that the symplectic condition is necessary and sufficient for canonical transformation even if it involves time. The whole thing with time is that it's more complicated math and you do these uh, infinitesimal canonical transformations that look like you're cheating at math, but it's supposed to work, yada, yada, yada. 
symplectic conditions apply generating functions? It's the same thing because the fundamental basis is the Poisson brackets. Now, uh, a couple of pages in section 8.1, yes, thank you. A couple of pages in section 8.1 and um, section 9.4 were the material for this presentation. Uh, you can't really get a, a, an appreciation for what's going on here until you read section 9.5. A canonical transformation is a coordinate transformation defined in phase space that does not change the Poisson bracket. It all comes down to the Poisson bracket. That is the mapping. That is the thing that is being done. It keeps your transformation canonical. If you take this matrix right here and put it through its motions, you will end up with the Poisson bracket. So it looks strange. And you want to know why you want why we're bothering? For Goldstein said, okay. Um, we're putting the direct conditions in a more elegant form, in a matrix form. But you know, those are, those are Hamilton's equations of motion. There's a minus sign there. And for some bizarre reason, it, it got a lot of people concerned because the, the canonical transformation wasn't going to be symmetrical. You don't have symmetrical, you know, your Q dot, your, your coordinate, your position doesn't have a minus sign. Your momentum derivative has a minus sign. Well, why is it They're not symmetrical? And a lot of, allegedly, a lot of schemes have been pursued to get that symmetry out of the way, to get, the, to get, to get that symmetry, and the symplectic method does it, and it's the one that, that's being used. Um, you may hear the word symmetry misused with the symplectic method. All symmetry means is that your cross on bracket with your generating function must be zero. And then the question, I guess, becomes is if you have a symmetry, is it canonical transformation? The answer is yes. And in fact, if somebody says it's a symplectic transformation, it's a canonical transformation, it's a Poisson transformation, they all mean the same thing because fundamentally it's the Poisson brackets. Now, if you have a canonical transformation, do you have a symmetry? And the answer is no, you don't because there's no requirement that the Poisson bracket of your generating function and your Hamiltonian must equal zero. If you go to, if you recall one of our homework problems, uh, it was that first one up there, but it did not ask for symplectic condition. We suffered through calculating F1 and F2. We had two generating functions to prove that that transformation was canonical. You can take this now and you can use the uh, symplectic method in about a couple, about a minute, to, for any value of the parameter alpha, to, uh, determine that the transformation is canonical. It's all about the Poisson brackets, you know, and um, it's very weird how all this stuff connects at a very fundamental level. Any questions? Did you guys get cookies? Did you guys get cookies? Did you guys get cookies? Okay, good, good, good. That, I don't care about the presentation. I care about you guys get cookies. Any questions? Anything? Questions? Okie dokie. I appreciate your time. Thank you for listening to me.